A Summary and Interpretation of 12 Rules for Life by Jordan Peterson Narrated and Interpreted by Alexander Sandalis Rule 5 Do not let your children do anything that makes you dislike them. Recently I watched a three-year-old boy trail his mother and father slowly through a crowded airport. He was screaming violently at five second intervals and more importantly he was doing it voluntarily. As a parent, I could tell from the tone he was irritating his parents and hundreds of other people to gain attention. Maybe he needed something, but that was nowhere to get it, and his parents should have let him know that. 30 seconds of carefully directed problem solving would have brought the shameful episode to a halt. Do not let your children do anything that makes you dislike them. I have also watched a couple unable or unwilling to say no to their two-year-old, obliged to follow closely behind him everywhere he went. Every moment of what was supposed to be an enjoyable social visit because he misbehaved so badly when not micromanaged that he could not be given a second of genuine freedom without risk. The desire of his parents to let their child act without correction on every impulse perversely produced precisely the opposite effect. They deprived him instead of every opportunity to engage in independent action because they did not dare to teach him what no means. He had no conception of the reasonable limits enabling maximal toddler autonomy. Do not let children do anything that makes you dislike them. I have similarly seen parents rendered unable to engage in adult conversation at a dinner party because their children 4 and 5 dominated the social scene, eating the centers out of all the sliced bread, subjecting everyone to their juvenile tyranny while mum and dad watched, embarrassed at bereft of their ability to intervene. Do not let children do anything to make you dislike them. Everybody hates arithmetic. Consider this story. One father recently spoke with me about trouble he was having putting his son to sleep. We did the arithmetic, and this ritual typically takes about three quarters of an hour of fighting. 45 minutes a day, seven days a week, 300 minutes, or five hours a week. Five hours for each of the four weeks a month, that's 20 hours per month. 20 hours a month for 12 months is 240 hours. That's a month and a half of standard 40 hour work weeks. So Jordan's client was spending a month and a half of work weeks per year fighting ineffectually and miserably with his son. Needless to say, both were suffering. And no matter how good your intentions are, or how sweet and tolerant your temperament is, you will not maintain good relations with someone you fight with for a month and a half of work weeks per year. Resentment will never inevitably build, even if it doesn't, all that wasted unpleasant time could clearly be spent in a more productive and useful and less stressful, more enjoyable activity. Do not let your children do anything to make you dislike them. Now, who's to blame? The parent, the child? Some localize the problem to the adult, to the parent. Uh, saying such things, there is no bad children, only bad parents. The problem about this perspective and argument is that it's too one-sided. It's dangerous and naively romantic. In the case of the parents granted, a, especially in the case of the parents who are granted a particularly difficult son or daughter, and it, the conclusion is that it merely displaces the problem back in time to the parents, to what's been done. It explains nothing and solves no problems. Now, I wouldn't go too far as say it is at that it explains nothing, uh, because I think both the parents and the child must be considered greatly to their own individual effects. Now. Who am I to even provide a perspective on parenting, children, child development, psychology on this topic? Who am I? It's clear, looking at me, that I most likely do not have a child, let alone multiple. This is true. I don't. However, just like an asshole, everyone's got an opinion. And this is mine. And this will be mine throughout this uh, rule. 
I'm extremely fascinated and interested and passionate about uh, learning about child development and uh, psychological development, childhood trauma, and how it influences individuals as they grow. Uh, so this is something I've spent quite a bit of time learning and researching on my own and something I, I, I will provide uh, my perspective on. So if it bothers you and you only listen to parents who are parents, sorry, only, only listen to people who are parents and have multiple children, then uh, this is not probably the uh, video for you. But if you are open to understanding that you can learn from anyone and... and, and that there is merit in some people's perspective who may not have children. Keep watching. The Ennoble Savage. So we know dogs must be socialized in order to become acceptable mem members of the pack. And children, much more complex than dogs. This means they are much more likely to go complexly astray if they are not trained, disciplined, and properly encouraged. This means that it is not just wrong to attribute all the violent tendencies of human beings to the pathologies of social structure, which is what Peterson earlier talked about in this rule, and that extends to blaming parents uh, only for a child's behavior. Children must be shaped, informed, or they cannot thrive. This fact is reflected starkly in their behavior. Kids are utterly desperate for attention from both peers and adults because such attention, which renders them effective and sophisticated communal players, is vitally necessary. Children can be damaged as much or more by lack of incisive attention as they are by abuse, mental or physical. This damage by omission rather than commission but it is no less severe and long-lasting by a mission not doing something, commission to do something. Children are damaged when their mercifully inattentive parents fail to make them sharp and observant and awake and leave them instead in unconscious and undifferentiated state. Children are damaged when those charged with their care, afraid of any conflict or upset, no longer dare to correct them and leave them without guidance. The lazy parent, the fearful parent, the... It's really just... A, the undisciplined individual who is now no longer willing to instill uh, any type of direction or challenging discipline. These children end up being uncarved blocks trapped in a perpetual state of waiting to be. Now let's talk about discipline. Parent or friend. Modern parents are simply paralyzed by the fear that they will no longer be liked or even loved by their children if they chastise them for any reason. They want their children's friendship above all and are willing to sacrifice respect to get it. This is not good. A child will have many friends, but only two parents. Remember that. It's very thought provoking. Friends have very limited authority to correct. Every parent therefore needs to learn to tolerate the momentary anger or even hatred directed toward them by their children after necessary corrective action has been taken, as the capacity of children to perceive or care about long-term consequences is very limited. Parents are the arbiters of society. They teach children how to behave so that other people will be able to make, will be able to interact meaningfully and productively with them. It is an act of responsibility to discipline a child. It is not anger at misbehavior. It is not revenge for a misdeed. It is instead a careful combination of mercy and long-term judgment. It's important to reframe how we think about discipline and parenting as a whole, right? Because I can, I can understand and slightly empathize, it's hard to, as someone who doesn't have a child, uh, you want to try and guide your child in the best, most optimal way possible for their growth and development. But at the same time, you want them to develop their skills themselves. And one mechanism for doing that is discipline, but you want to be liked by your child. You want your child to like you. So when you feel a short-term burst of emotion and anger directed to you from your child from a child i guess that could make a lot of parents feel insecure about their position as a parent and whether they're uh, wanting their child to like them whether they're how much their child likes them and whether they're affecting the severity of this how much they're affecting uh their child's likeness towards them now I'm going to recount a pretty intriguing story of Peterson uh, parenting his son and what he did when his son refused to eat 
uh, a sufficient amount of food. So Peterson said said himself that his son was particularly ornery, uh, someone, a child with a particularly unpleasant or ugly uh, temperament, challenging to deal with. And so what he, he he noticed that his son was not eating enough food. He would just go out and play after eating a couple of mouthfuls. He'd be done. He'd play with the food. He'd uh, test the limitations of his environment through this play. But it was affecting his sleep because he wasn't eating enough. And then the child's sleep was then consequently affecting uh, the parents, Peterson and his wife, because then they would be woken up in the middle of the night and that would cascade into more problems because sleep deprivation causes a whole bunch of problems. And... So he decided, I'm going to go to war with you, child. I, you will not be, you will not defeat me. Wait, you're going to finish everything on this plate today and eat exactly what you need to eat for your sustenance and growth. And he said something very interesting, like a patient adult can defeat a two-year-old as hard as that is to believe. So they sat down, looked themselves in the eyes and they knew, all right, we're going to war right here. Here we go. So time after time, Peterson would, would try and feed him. The kid would dodge the spoon of food. Um, he would try little techniques like poking him um, in a playful manner, but a st- n- nothing to harm him, but poke him in a playful manner that would, would kind of annoy him and, and get his attention while he tried to put the spoon in his mouth. Of course, the child would resist, uh, but eventually he would open his mouth, uh, admitting outrage and emotion at the annoyance of being poked. And so Peterson put the spoon in his mouth. Of course, the child then tried to reject the food out of his mouth and and push it out of his mouth. So Peterson put his finger up to his mouth. And um, of course, some came out, but not all of it didn't. And some were swallowed. Good. We've had had a good win. But at this point, he didn't just repeat it over and over again. He positively reinforced his son. He gave him a pat on the head and told him he was a good boy and he meant it. When someone does something for you and you're trying to get them to do, reward them. So he would repeat this process and after an hour later, it was all done. Yes, there was outrage. Yes, there was emotional overspill. Uh, There was wailing. There was stress. But the food was eaten by the child. His son collapsed on him, exhausted, and they napped. And then when they woke up, his son liked him a lot better than he had before he was disciplined. The lesson is, do not let your child do anything to make you dislike them. There was a clear line drawn in the sand after that day. Discipline and punish. Modern parents are terrified of two frequently juxtaposed words. Discipline and punish. You know, because the, the images they evoke are very uh, dark. Prisons, soldiers, pain, suffering. The distance between disciplinarian and tyrant or punishment and torture is indeed easily traversed. But discipline and punish must be handled with care. It's not that it's impossible to discipline with reward. In fact, rewarding good behavior can be very effective. And the most common, most famous example is B.F. Skinner, the psychologist and the experiments he ran. Skinner would teach certain animals to perform such acts and he would use exceptional care. Any actions that approximated what he was aiming at were immediately followed by reward of just the right size, not small enough to be inconsequential, not so large as it devalued future rewards. What did Peterson just do in the previous story? That's what he did, the pat on the head, good boy. Like that's positive reinforcement uh, with the same level of severity or the same level of intensity to which the action that was being produced, which was eating the food, right? This can be applied to anybody, any action, any behavior, any person. This this tr- transcends uh, just behavior with children. But let's bring it back to children because that is the topic and context. So imagine you would like your toddler to help set up a table. It's a useful skill. You'd like him to be better if he could do it. It would be good for his self-esteem. In brackets, shut up of how overused that term is. So you break the target behavior down into its component parts. One element of setting the table is carrying a plate from the cupboard to the table. Even that might be too complex. Perhaps your child has only been walking a few months. 
So you start training him to handle a plate and having it, having him give it back to you. So you hand him plate, hands it back to you. And a pat on the head could suffice to follow. And you can now turn this into a game. So you pass with your left, switch to your right, and he circles it around his back. Then you might give him a plate, take a few steps back so that he has to traverse a few steps before giving it back to you. And you train him to become a plate handling, uh, skilled virtu virtuoso. So now you're teaching him, you know, motor skills as well as uh, behave as like a positive um, obedience. And you can teach virtually anyone anything with such an approach. So you can see there is breaking down. Like let's think about this. Like this is this is a complex but very simple thing. You have a skill you want to teach. So you break down it into its component parts. Say for example, you're teaching someone to kick a ball. You break it down into its component parts. You have a swing back phase. You have a tr uh, transition phase, and you have a follow through phase. So you break down these into its in, into these component parts the same way you do as like a, a basketball free throw, or right here with the plate. He's not getting him to walk all across the house with the plate. Can you drop this at the table and go back and do this and do this? No, he's breaking it down. Positive reinforcement. Good job. Verbally, action. Figure out auditorily. Figure out what the person requires the most um, adequately to be positively reinforced. Applies to all skills. Here's another great example. Say your son or daughter has become quite reserved since they've become a teenager and you want them to talk more, to communicate more. So that your target response or, or outcome is more communication. So one morning over breakfast, she shares a short anecdote about school. That's a very excellent time to pay attention. That's the reward. Stop texting, stop looking at your phone, stop looking at the window, stop being distracted and pay attention. Because unless you don't want her to tell you anything ever again, then you're gonna need to give her the attention she, does, she requires for a more better functioning uh, set of communication skills and, and relationship with you. This can be said of anything. If there is an outcome you want to happen from somebody, you want somebody to open up to you, you want somebody to try and be a bit more optimistic, take more initiative. When they express that outcome that you see them wanting to produce more of, that you say, you say this skill, this outcome would make a better relationship between us. It would make a better life for you. Reward them adequately. Because if you, and you have, we know from psychology that you want to get the positive reinforcement reward as close as possible to the outcome stimulus. And if you don't, the chance of that outcome happening again uh, is not as high. But what about pain and suffering and negative emotion as a, as a way to, or negative reinforcement as a way to uh, produce an outcome behavior Well, we know that when pain hurts us and I think it's Sigma Freud who said, you know We're either every action that we take is either towards pleasure or away from pain. Okay towards satisfaction or away from suffering and pain, so We know that when we experience pain Usually that's telling us and usually so we don't repeat that same action again Anxiety makes us stay away from hurtful people and bad places so we don't have to feel pain all these emotions must be balanced against each other and carefully judged in context, but they're all required to keep us alive and thriving. We therefore do our children disservice by failing to use whatever is available to help them learn, including negative emotions, even though such use should occur in the most merciful possible manner. But this is a justification for the utility of negative emotion, for the utility of negative reinforcement. Maybe I'm not using that term exactly correct, but using uh, negative emotion as a tool. Okay, it has a place. But we live in a world where, as Peterson says, is paralyzed at the thought of interfering with the hypothetical, pristine path of natural child development. And this is something I can relate to because it's like, when do you cross between childhood trauma and pain? Like, when is too much? When do you apply too much pain um, and negative emotion, and that uh, now steeps into uh, some type of trauma? It can be a fine line. Children cannot be fully sheltered from fear and pain. They cannot be. There, there, are, there are dramatic consequences from doing this. They don't know much about the world and it is our responsibility to teach them. So even when they are doing something as natural as learning to walk, they're constantly being walloped by the world, right? They're learning pain, what it is like to fall on the ground from the start. Given this concept, we know that we can't... 
We know that to shelter children completely from misadventure and failure so they never experience any fear or pain is doing them a disservice. So we have to find how to maximize their learning so that useful knowledge may be gained with minimal cost. And this is actually seen in the uh, Disney movie Sleeping Beauty, this, this uh, symbol. So the king and the queen, they have a daughter, for those who haven't seen it, called Princess Aurora. There is another character called Maleficent, which is a play on words, I believe, for malevolent, um, to commit evil and wrongdoing. And the king and queen plan for her daughter a christening to introduce her to the world. But they don't invite Malef uh, Maleficent. Uh, fucking. Ma they don't invite Maleficent. Jeez! what is that symbolic of? That is symbolic of these two overprotecting monarchs, the king and queen, who are setting up a world around their daughter where they're nerfing the edges for their daughter because they're essentially removing the negative. They're removing the negative emotion, the malevolence, um, and creating a world that has nothing negative in it. But this does not protect her, but it makes her weak. And Malef Maleficent ends up cursing the princess and sentencing her to death. Fortunately, a good fairy, a positive element of nature, reduces this punishment to unconsciousness and redeemable with one's first kiss. And so what the panicked king and queen do, the panicked parents do, when their child falls on the ground, this is a symbol, remember, when the child falls on the ground and scrapes their knee, what do they do? They get rid of all the spinning wheels in the land and they turn their daughter over to the much too nice fairies, of whom there are three. What does this mean? Now, little Johnny can't walk down the street without holding his parents' hand because his parents are too afraid he's going to fall and scrape his knee again. So now, Johnny doesn't know what it's like to walk by himself down the street and scrape his knee and hurt his hand and trip and stumble. So now, by removing the dangerous things from the world, they've left their son or daughter, so here, the King Queen have left their daughter, naive, immature, and weak, and the other parents over here have left their, their, their son um, very similar, naively and immaturely weak and prepared for the world. This is a symbol for overprotecting parents, overprotected children. So when they have their first real contact with failure or worse, genuine malevolence, because it's out there, it's everywhere, they will not understand and they will not know how to cope and respond to such real evil. They have no defense. It's like an immune system. Our immune system, every time we have a virus or bacterial infection our immune system builds antibodies to the said virus or bacterial infection so we build our defenses all the way from a young age from infancy and we build a strong immune system we're building a defense from the world through exposure to negative experience to a virus just like an immune system a child needs adequate exposure to negative emotion negative experience pain and suffering in order to build their own foundation of defense against the world if they don't they will not be prepared for when that pain suffering evil virus, bacteria, infects them. It's the concept of, that Aunt Nassim Talib talks about, anti-fragility. It describes that a system needs to be tested, challenged, and shocked to develop a framework of defense. For example, I've heard uh, Jonathan Haidt talk about that they're actually not in his school that his daughter attends in New York. The kids are not allowed to exclude each other on the playground anymore. They're not allowed to express exclusion. Hold on. Exclusion has been a tool for uh, necessary group relationship dynamics. You exclude people in a tribe who are not valuable members of your tribe, who are harming your tribe, or who do not provide any, any, any value, right? 
every member of a tribe will have a server purpose and has a role. So what happens now, now 2019, we don't live in tribes anymore, but we still have communities and we still have uh, groups of people and we have social structures and social dynamics and, and competent hierarchies. So what happens now when we mitigate or eliminate our, a child's ability to express the necessary fundamental ability to exclude another? then the kid doesn't understand social structures. Children have, are supposed to have thousands of conflicts and challenging social interactions from insults to teasing to exclusion to learn how to adequately deal with the reality of social structures, of relationship building, of communication. So if you put your child in a world where they don't get excluded, teased, insulted from 0 to 18 or from 0 to 3 or whatever time period, what do you think is going to happen? What type of what type of person do you think you're going to mold? We're starting to see it. Little snowflakes walking around who are very sensitive to insult to YouTube comments insulting them. Facebook, Instagram, people, keyboard warriors, people are being seriously affected by this epidemic of snowflakes. Snowflake syndrome. <laughs> I'm being facetious, obviously, but people are being uh, very affected by uh, a comment somebody makes on their profile and because they haven't been adequately exposed to real insults and exclusion and maybe they have but they haven't learned to deal and, and learn how to handle and maneuver through these real sorts of conflict it's not about exposing someone to excessive suffering and exclusion or conflict it's about exposing them to the necessary amounts for optimal development so they can sufficiently be prepared for the world. If you raise your children and raise yourself in a manner that sees the world as dangerous and threatening, you raise yourself and all your kids to be emotionally stunted. These kids will not be prepared for the world and they will have they will most likely have higher propensity for uh, psychological disorders because all that shit all the all the shit that they're going to consume in the world once they get into the real world is going to weigh heavy on their conscience and they won't know what to do with it I really stopped caring about how long these videos get this is um this is quite liberating for me I'm just, I'm going to go I'm just going to I'm just going to talk so if this is too long for you then um I don't care. Take the case of the three-year-old who has not learned to share. She displays her selfish behavior in the presence of her parents, but they're too nice to intervene. More truthfully, they refuse to pay attention, admit to what is happening, and teach her how to act properly. They're annoyed, of course, when she won't share with her sister, but they're prepared to they're prepared to pretend everything is okay. But it's not okay. They'll snap at her later for something totally unrelated. And that is exactly where trauma can occur exactly where that moment when you snap at something from completely unrelated that you're on the edge of chaos she'll be hurt by that and confused and learn nothing worse when she tries to make friends it won't go well because of her lack of social sophistication children her own age will be put off by her inability to cooperate they'll fight with her or wander off find someone else to play with the parents of those children will observe her awkwardness and misbehavior and won't invite her back to play with their kids she will be lonely and rejected one parent one child at a time that will produce anxiety depression and resentment that will produce the turning from life that is equivalent to the wish for unconsciousness Parents who refuse to adopt the responsibility for disciplining their children think they can just opt out of this, 
of the conflict necessary for proper child rearing. They avoid being the bad guy in the short term, but they do not at all rescue or protect their children from fear or pain. Quite the contrary, the judgmental and uncaring broader social world will meet out conflict and punishment far greater than which would have been delivered by an awake parent. You can discipline your children or you can turn that responsibility over to the harsh, uncaring, judgmental world. And the motivation for the latter decision should never never be confused with love. It's really just ignorance and... Uh, what's the word? Um, lazy. Incompetent. But you might object. You might have a rebuttal. As modern parents sometimes do, why should a child even be subject to the arbitrary dictates of a parent? from what I understand, essentially saying, you know, why should the parent be the, the end-all be-all of this child's view of the world? First, why should a child be subject to the dictates of a parent? That's easy. Every child must listen to and obey adults because he or she is dependent on the care that one or more imperfect grown-ups is willing to bestow. Simple as that. Every child should also be taught to comply gracefully with the expectations of civil society. This does not mean crushed into mindless ideology and conformity, which many parents do, and which is what that rebuttal might insinuate. It means instead that parents must reward those attitudes and actions that will bring their child success in the world outside the family and use threat and punishment when necessary to eliminate behaviors that will lead to misery and failure. Notice the words I'm articulating and emphasizing. There's a, tight window of there's a tight window of opportunity for this as well. So getting it right quickly matters. If a child has not been taught to behave properly by the age four, it will forever be difficult for him or her to make friends. Now, Jordan's put hundreds of ref Peterson's put hundreds of references in this book, but he unfortunately he does not have a reference for that point. I really would like to read it. So if anyone has it, let me know. So there's a uh, he talked about this ideal time by age four that if you're not socialized properly then the, the consequences can be quite catastrophic and long term uh, he says the literature is quite clear on this again no reference uh, this matters because peers are the primary source of socialization after the age of four rejected children cease to develop because they are alienated from their peers and they fall further and further behind as the other children continue to progress. Thus, the friendless child too often becomes the lonely, antisocial, or depressed teenager and adult. This is not good. Much more of our sanity than we commonly realize is a consequence of our fortunate immersion in a social community, particularly built from a young age. Now, can you still transform yourself as an adult? Of course you can. It happens every day, and people try and do it every day. Peterson, ironically, helps people who have had this stunted socialization from a young age, from ages four and under, helps those people grow to be better human beings, better functioning human beings, okay? So of course it's possible to transform yourself even though you may have been rejected from this age, from this young age, of course. But you'd rather mitigate it if possible, right? Because we know poorly socialized children have terrible lives. They express themselves in the worst types of people in our society. So it's better to socialize them properly. And some of this can be done with reward, like we talked about earlier, but not all of it. The issue is therefore not whether to use punishment and threat. The issue is whether to do it consciously and thoughtfully. How then should children be disciplined? This is a very difficult question because children and parents differ vastly in their temperaments. Some children are agreeable. Some are disagreeable. You know, then you get other kids who are tougher minds and are more independent. And those kids want to do what they want when they want all the time. They can be challenging, non-compliant, and stubborn. So they need to be treated in a different way. Some children are desperate for rules and structure and are content even in rigid environments. Others with little regard for predictability and routine are immune to demands for even minimal necessary order. Some are wildly imaginative, creative, you get it. These are all deep, important differences, heavily influenced by biological factors and are difficult to modify socially. So, you need to understand your child and parent them accordingly to their individual set of characteristics, but using the foundation of this rule uh, to implement. Minimum necessary force. Here's a straightforward initial idea. Rules should not be multiplied beyond necessity. Don't encumber children or their disciplinarians with too many rules. That path leads to frustration. I, say, I think this has been done to myself. Um, I've seen this being done to people. It's like you, 
you, you give, and I've probably done this too. <sighs> you have like a a way you want to look at the world, the way you want your world around you to be, uh, a, ca- a set of characteristics that you want to live by, and so you try and implement this similar order to your child. But, and often it's too much. Instead of throwing a dozen different rules, I. Th- it seems like the best, most effective method is to go one at a time, one rule at a time, and let them be rules that essentially the minimum effective dose. So what, what is the set of rules that are gonna cover the most um, amount of behaviors that you wanna help uh, control or mold? And of course you have to figure out what do you do when each rule gets broken? You know there's going to be a consequence for each one. So you have to figure that out. So if you have a thousand rules and you have a consequence for each one, it's going to be very confusing for the child because you're not going to implement those rules evenly. So like he just says here, a context of independent rule for punishment severity is hard to establish. However, a helpful norm has already been enshrined in English common law, one of the greatest products of Western civilization. Its analysis can help establish a second useful principle English common law allows you to defend your rights, but only in a reasonable manner. Someone breaks into your house, you have a loaded pistol, you have the right to defend yourself. But you better do it in stages. What if it's a drunk, what if it's a drunk confused neighbor? Shoot him immediately, you think? It's not that simple. So you say instead, stop, I have a gun. If that produces neither explanation nor retreat, you might consider a warning shot. Then if, a, if the perpetrator still advances, you might consider taking aim at their leg. A single brilliantly practical principle can be used to generate all these incrementally more severe reactions, that of minimum necessary force. So now we have two general principles. The first, limit the rules. The second, use the least force necessary to enforce those rules. And that could look like giving your child or son or friend, person, a warning, a verbal warning, then a physical warning, but not too harsh and not abusive, but stern and authoritarian. And then you could go so on and so forth until the desired outcome has reached within reasonable means. So if the first is if the first principle is limit the rules, what do you limit the rules to exactly? Here are some suggestions, Peterson puts. Do not bite, kick, hit, except in self-defense. Do not torture and bully other children so you don't end up in jail. Eat in a civilized and thankful manner so that people are happy to have you in your house and pleased to feed you. Learn to share so other kids play with you. Pay attention when spoken to adults so they don't have so they don't hate you and might therefore deign to teach you something. Go to sleep properly and peacefully so your parents can have a private life and a private life and not resent your existence. Take care of your belongings because you need to learn how and because you're lucky to have them. Be good company when something fun is happening so you're invited for that fun again. Act so that other people are happy you're around so that people will want you around. A child who knows these rules will be welcome everywhere. Hell, an adult who knows these rules will be welcome everywhere. Adults need to know these rules just as well because I tell you, we make the same mistakes. And what about the second principle? Equally important. What is the minimum necessary force? This must be established experimentally, starting with the smallest possible intervention. I briefly touched on my opinion before. Now we're going to get Peterson's perspective. Some children will be stone shook by glare. A verbal command will stop another. A thumb cocked flick index finger on the small on the hand might be necessary force for some. Such a strategy is particularly useful in public places such as restaurants. You know, it can be administered suddenly, quietly, effectively without risking es- escalation. And they've learnt that the little flick is that they've, they've learnt from previous conditioning that that's uh, that's serious. Now, understand that children will definitely misbehave more in public because they are experimenting and trying to establish if the same old rules they were in their home apply to this new place in, in a new environment in, outside in the real world. And so they don't sort that out verbally, not when they're under three. So you can't just assume that they're going to understand that home rules is outside rules. It has to be established and conditioned. Parenting is just... It's, it's, it seems like a very, very challenging... It is a very, very challenging uh, <laughs> thing to maneuver around. 
Uh, just consider all this. This is this is the, the, the guideline, the foundation to do it effectively, as effectively as possible. Like, for example, Peterson tells a story. Well, he learned that after his children sitting in a restaurant for 45 minutes, they knew it was time to go because they would get antsy and little, and they would get fidgety and they would start to misbehave. So that was part of the deal. They, they conditioned their children. You give us 45 minutes of well behavior, we will not have you sit here and put up with being stuck in this position, sitting in a chair behaving for any longer. Because we know you want to play and be a child, right? So they had a, like a little deal they made with their child. You know, they weren't always properly behaved, but they were most of the time. And it was wonderful to see people responding so positively to their presence. It was truly good for the kids. And they could see that people liked them. And this reinforced their good behavior. That was the reward. And part of establishing a relationship with your son or daughter is learning how this person responds to disciplinary intervention. You know, it's very easy to mouth cliches and you hear it all the time that, oh, there's no excuse for physical punishment or hitting children merely teaches them to hit. It's like, uh, it's like a very convenient cliche to fall back on as a, a, almost virtue signaling to other people that, oh, look at me on my moral pedestal. I would never do that. But let's understand everything has a, has its time and place, does it not? There is an exception to everything, is there not? So let's start with the former claim, there is no excuse for physical punishment. We should note that almost all sanctions in life involve punishment in its many psychological and more direct physical forms. Deprivation of liberty causes pain in a manner essentially similar to that of physical trauma. The same can be said of the use of social isolation, including time out. We know this neurobiologically. So he's making it clear that physical punishment isn't just simply physical. It has other forms that people may already be doing, such as time out. That is a form of psychological punishment. So you're going to get a parent who's going to say, I would never hit my child, but you're going to get that same parent putting that child in, in, in time out. Well, hold on. The physical doesn't just extend to somatosensory. It extends to neuropsychologically and also we should note that some behavior must be brought to halt effectively and immediately not least so that something worse doesn't happen so what's the proper punishment for someone who will not stop poking a fork into the electrical socket or runs away laughing in a crowded supermarket parking lot the answer is simple whatever will stop it fastest within reason because the alternative could be fatal that is the exception. It has to be. Because the, because the consequence is too high. To unthinkingly parrot the magical line there is no excuse for physical punishment is also to foster the delusion that teenage devils magically emerge from one innocent little child angels. You're not doing your child any favors by overlooking any misbehavior, particularly if he or she is temperamentally more, temperamentally more aggressive. To hold the no excuse for physical punishment theory is also to assume that the word no can be effectively uttered to another person in the absence of threat of punishment. A woman can say no to a powerful narcissistic man only because she has social norms, the law and the state backing her up. A parent can only say no to a child who wants a third piece of cake because he or she is larger, stronger and more capable than the child. And additionally backed up in this authority by law and state. What no means in, in the final analysis is always, if you continue to do that, something you do not like will happen to you. That is what no must mean with parenting. And that is what I've learned from not parenting myself or from being parented that and watching other parents that it can fall astray when, when the word no becomes misconstrued. It's like, oh, wait, you can learn, you, you, you learn from submissive parents and inconsistent parenting that the word no doesn't actually mean something bad will happen to me. I can get away with more. And so you you behave with more, more malevolence because that's what you've learned. You haven't been tempered. What about the idea that hitting a child merely teaches them to hit? First, no, wrong, it's too simple for starters. Hitting is a very unsophisticated work to describe the disciplinary act of an effective parent. 
If hitting accurately described the entire range of physical force, then there would be no difference between rain droplets and atom bombs. Magnitude matters, and so does context, if we're not being willfully blind and naive about the issue. Every child knows the difference between being bitten by a mean, unprovoked dog and being nipped by its own pet when he tries, to play, tries playfully but too carelessly to take its bone. How hard someone is hit and why they are hit cannot merely be ignored when speaking of hitting. Timing, part of context, is also a crucial importance. If you flick your two-year-old with your finger just after he smacks the baby on the head with a wooden block, he will get the connection and be at least somewhat less willing to smack her again in the future. That seems, l seems like a good outcome, right? He certainly won't conclude that he should hit her more using the flick of his mother's fingers as an example. He's not stupid. He's just jealous, impulsive, and not very sophisticated. How else are you going to protect his younger sibling? If you discipline effectively, then the baby will suffer. Maybe for years. The bullying will continue because you won't do a damn thing to stop it because you're afraid to, to confide to this social cliche and norm. You'll, afford, you'll avoid the conflict that's necessary to establish peace, you'll turn a blind eye, and then later, when your child confronts you, maybe in adulthood, you'll say, I never knew it was like that. No, you just didn't want to know, so you didn't. You just rejected the responsibility of discipline and justified it with a continual show of your niceness. Every gingerbread house has a witch inside that, that devours its children. So where does all this leave us? With the decision to discipline effectively or to discipline ineffectively? But never the decision to forego discipline altogether because, the nature, because nature and society will punish in a draconian manner whatever errors of children behavior remain uncorrected. So here are a few practical hints. Time out can be an extremely effective form of punishment, particularly if the misbehaving child is welcome as soon as he controls his temper. An angry child should sit by himself until he calms down, then he should be allowed to return to normal life. That means the child wins instead of his anger. The rule is, come be with us as soon as you can behave properly. That is a very good deal for a child, parent and society. You'll be able to tell if your child has really regained control. You'll like him again despite his earlier misbehavior. If you're still mad, maybe he hasn't completely rep repented, or maybe you should do something about your tendency to hold a grudge. If your child is the kind of determined varmint who simply runs away laughing when placed on the steps or in his room, physical restraint might have to be added to the time out routine. A child can be held carefully but firmly by the upper arm until he or she stops squirming and pays attention. If that fails, being turned over parent's knee might be required. And it's going to make a lot of people uncomfortable, especially in the 21st century 2019, 2020 parenting. It's like, no, I would never, I would never hit my child. I appreciate Peterson's candidness and how he's putting him, his character on the line, saying it's going to, it might be necessary sometimes. For the child who's pushing the limits in a spectacularly inspired way, a squat across the backside can indicate requisite seriousness on the part of a responsible adult. There are some situations in which even that will not suffice, partly because some children are very determined, exploratory and tough, or because the offending behavior is truly severe. And if you're not thinking such things through, then you're not acting responsibly as a parent. You're leaving the dirty work to someone else who will be much dirtier doing it. Point is, the kid's gonna get smacked across the backside regardless. So you're gonna be the one to do it? Or are you going to let the world do it? It's a question. A summary of principles. Disciplinary principle one. Limit the rules. Principle two. Use minimum necessary force. Here's a third. Parents should come in pairs. Raising young children is demanding and exhausting. Because of this, it's easy for a parent to make a mistake. Insomnia, hunger, and the aftermath of an argument, a hangover, bad day at work, any of these things can simply make a person unreasonable. While in combination, they can produce someone dangerous. Under such circumstances, it is necessary to have someone else around to observe and step in and discuss. This will make it less likely that a whiny provocative child and her fed up cranky parent will excite each other to the point of no return. Parents should come in pairs so that the father of a newborn can watch the new mother so she won't get worn out and do something desperate after hearing a colicky baby wail from 11 in the evening until 5 in the morning for 30 minutes in a row. Here's a fourth principle. One that is more particularly psychological. Parents should understand their own capacity to be harsh, vengeful, arrogant, resentful, angry, and deceitful. Very few people set out consciously to do a terrible job as a father or mother. But bad parenting happens all the time. Isn't that interesting? 
We all want, think we want to do a good job. We all have great intentions. But, but fucking, look at the world. Like, there's a lot of, of shitty people around who, who, are, who are, have very uh, questionable characters. This is because people have a great capacity for evil as well as good. And because they remain willfully blind to that fact, people are aggressive and selfish, as well as kind and thoughtful. For this reason, no adult human being, no hierarchical predatory ape, can truly tolerate being dominated by an upstart child. Revenge will have come. Ten minutes after a pair of all too nice and patient parents have failed to prevent a public tantrum at the local supermarket, they will pay their toddler back with the cold shoulder when he runs up excited to show mum and dad his newest accomplishment. Enough embarrassment, disobedience, and dominance, challenge, and, e and even the most hypothetically selfless parent will become resentful. This is dangerous because resentment is one of the worst uh, poisons a parent or can ad admit to their child. Because when that child gets the cold shoulder to something they're proud to have created, that teaches that child something very, very dark and, and dangerous. It's a very important time in their development, and when when that child is not shown a requisite needed attention for a good deed, then that's where a fractured character begins to be, be developed. It's a shame, but it really requires a great amount of attention and detail to be shown for each moment of parenting. I, I can't I, I can't even imagine how I can't imagine how tremendously difficult it must be. Resentment breeds the desire for vengeance. Fewer spontaneous offers of love will be offered with more rationalizations for their obedience. Fewer opportunities for the personal development of the child will be sought out. A subtle turning away will begin. And this only is the beginning of the road to total familial warfare, conducted mostly in the underworld underneath the false facade of normality and love. This frequently traveled path by parents is best avoided. A parent who is seriously aware of his or her limited tolerance and capacity for misbehavior when provoked can therefore seriously plan a proper disciplinary strategy, particularly if monitored by an equally awake partner, and never let things degenerate to a point where genuine hatred emerges. This is very key. You must be aware of yourself. And this is, we see young parents, we, we're not even young. I mean, it just happens to be uh, statistically that young people are not conscious or aware of themselves or self-aware of their character and so it particularly happens with with young parents under 30 or under 25 that these kids are, are molded these these fractured children are molded so it seems like a key to raising a a decent child is to know yourself be self-aware about your who you are and your tendencies for malevolence and benevolence benevolence otherwise you risk forth going those tendencies onto your child beware there are toxic families everywhere they make no rules and limit no misbehavior the parents lash out randomly and unpredictably the children live in that chaos and are crushed if they're timid or rebel counterproductively if they're tough it's not good they can get murderous Here's a fifth and final most general principle. Parents have a duty to act as proxies for the real world. Proxies. Meaning they, they have to be a conduit. They have to be the, 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 the mirror into the, into the real world. Merciful proxies. Caring proxies, but proxies nonetheless. This obligation supersedes any responsibility to ensure happiness, foster creativity, or boost self-esteem. For example, if you... If your child grows up during wartime, that child must understand wartime over happiness and creativity and self-esteem. There is a there is a whole host of uh, people who grew up during World War Two, World War One. Um, these people know what it's like. They understand malevolence. They understand suffering and they understand pain because their parents had really no choice but to show their children by proxy that what the world is like it's not it's not the nicest place right now and guess what it's it's really not it, it, it can be but it's really not a lot of the time uh, depending on where you look and right now where you look it's pretty bleak so these these people have learnt uh, 
and this obligation supersedes any responsibility. It's the primary duty of parents to make their children socially desirable. And that will provide the child with opportunity, self-regard, and security. It's more important even that. It's more important even than fostering individual identity. The holy grail can only be pursued in any case after a high degree of social sophistication has been established. So sophistic social sophistication and, and skills in that regard is regarded as one of the most important things it, se it seems like. It seems like, according to Peterson and uh, the, the literature that he's uh, summating. Lastly, the good child and the responsible parent. A properly socialized three-year-old is polite and engaging. She's also no pushover. She invokes interest from other children and appreciation from adults. She exists in a world where other kids welcome her and compete for her attention, and where adults are happy to see her instead of hiding behind false smiles. She will be introduced to the world by people who are pleased to do so. This will do more for her than eventual individuality than any cowardly parental attempt to avoid day-to-day -day conflict and discipline. Discuss your likes and dislikes with regards to your children with your partner or, failing that, a friend. But do not be afraid to have likes and dislikes, especially dislikes. Having clarified your stance, having assessed yourself for pettiness, arrogance and resentment, you take the next step and you make your children behave. You take responsibility for their discipline. You take responsibility for the mistakes you will inevitably make your make while disciplining. You can apologize when you're wrong and learn to do better. You love your kids after all. If their actions make you dislike them, think what an effect they will have on other people who care much less about you, about them than you. Think about that. Think about that deeply. If an action of your child makes you dislike them, put yourselves in the shoes of other people and how that's going to make them feel and the effect that's going to have on your child. Those other people will punish them severely by omission or commission. They don't care. They're not their parent. Don't allow that to happen. Better to let your little monsters know what is desirable and what is not so they become sophisticated den denizens of the world outside of the family. A child who pays attention instead of drifting and can play and who does not whine and is, and is comical but not annoying and is trustworthy, that child will have friends wherever he goes. He will thrive in what can so easily be a cold, unforgiving, hostile world. Clear rules make for a secure children and calm, rational parents. Clear principles of discipline and punishment balance mercy and justice so that social development and psychological maturity can be optimally promoted. Clear rules and proper discipline help the child and the family and society establish, maintain, and expand the order that is all that protects us from chaos and the terrors of the underworld, where everything is uncertain, anxiety-provoking, hopeless, and depressing. There are no greater gifts that a committed and courageous parent can bestow. Do not let your children do anything that makes you dislike them. Woo! If you've made it this far guys i want you to please let me know i'm not going to add really any uh, graphics to this video because it is so long and i want to do a little experiment i want to see guys do you actually care that much if there are no uh, animations or graphics or uh, on the screen um compared to my other rules let me know in the comments please uh, i really need to know i would like to know your feedback because for these exceptionally long videos uh it's very time consuming and it's best that I save the time for other things. But lastly, if you would like to volunteer uh, or know somebody who would like to volunteer for the role of maybe uh, editing these videos, please contact me uh, via the links below in uh, the description, any of my social media below, uh, because I would love uh, some, some help and assistance and maybe we can ex uh, discuss exchanging uh, some type of uh, uh, monetary uh, compensation. Thank you.